this is the art zone. This is the art zone. This is the art zone, a video document of the arts and artists of Metro Rockford. This art zone. Interviews with Rockford artists Keith Grace and Betsy Youngquist. A backstage look at the design and technical magic of New American Theater's Peter Pan. And the art of cooking at Octane Inner Lounge. Hi, I'm Doc Slavkoski and this is The Art Zone. We're coming to you from J.R. Cortman Center for Design, downtown in the heart of Rockford's cultural district. This art zone takes you backstage at New American Theater for an exclusive look at the technical magic that was created by the production people of Peter Pan. Dennis Horton goes into the kitchen with head chef Eric Olson of Octane Inner Lounge, one of downtown's hippest restaurants. And we'll take you to opening night of Art by the Yard at Cortman Gallery to talk with artist Keith Grace and then Art to Art featuring artist Matt Herbig interviewing artist Betsy Youngquist about her Cortman Gallery exhibition. And for just a ram minute, the opening of the Tom Heflin exhibition at the Rockford Art Museum. So sit back, relax, and enter the art zone. Now we're going to take you backstage at New American Theater for an exclusive look at some of the technical magic that was created by some very talented behind-the-scenes people who worked on the 1997 production of Peter Pan. We're at New American Theater and we're going to take you backstage to see a little bit of putting together the magic of Peter Pan. And uh, we're right now in a dressing room just across from the costume shop, and we're going to talk with one of the magic makers, and this is the costume designer, John Accardo. John, tell us a little bit about the challenges of putting the show together, because this is a, a whole new thing for New American Theater. It certainly is. Um, the challenges were to try to create costumes, maybe the costume for Peter, um, that hasn't been done before, like a green tunic or whatever, you know, just to make something different. And I think we accomplished that. And um, to make Neverland clothes on the boys, on the Lost Boys, uh, fun and interesting and, and um, colorful. And um, like Bill had said earlier too today, um, you know, there's all seasons are on the island of Neverland all the time. And so the boys' clothes reflect no season or all seasons, and it's uh, it's fun to do. And um, that was it. those were some challenges. Also, you have the, the technical challenges. I mean, you have to design into the costumes. I mean, these people fly around, right? right. So and so we had to design, um, try to design places for hooks and things that, you know, hook them up to the fly lines. And uh, right now, too, we're dealing with the people from FOI, and they're helping us with uh, putting the harnesses on and then deciding where things go in the costume to house all the, the little mechanisms that we need. You know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about the theater is that all of your costumes are designed and built right here in, in the costume shop. Uh, tell us about doing that. From, you have to start out with sketches and you, you read the play and then you know, tell us a little bit about the creative process. Okay. Um, I read the play, uh, sit down with the director and talk about sort of what he's looking for too. And um, usually you get a little leeway so you could use your own creative thoughts, but he'll give you a basic, this is what we're looking for kind of a idea. That's um, where we talked about Neverland and colors and things like that. I came up with um, some sketches and colored renderings and meet again with the director and we started from there and everything is built here or put together here somehow. The only two costumes that we didn't do here are the uh, crocodile and the dog, Nana. And uh, Peter Pan's outfit or a costume, I guess I should say, that's kind of like hand woven fabric or you, you, you designed a very complicated uh, yeah, a piece of clothing. <laughs> <laughs> and it took a while to do. We did, um, it's layers of strips of fabric, and there's just strips layered together and then all woven. And it's um, green and gold and burgundy and several shades of green uh, and all woven together. So it became a little bit more magical than just a green tunic, you know. What's your, this is, sounds like a corny question, but what's your favorite costume in the show? Would it be Hook, do you think? No. He's one of them. And Peters, I like a lot. And um, 
I like them all. I think some of the pirates and some of the combinations of things. So right now I don't have a favorite one. I mean, it's like I love to look at Hook and I love to look at Peter Pan's costume, but uh, no favorites really right this minute. We're on the set of the uh, new production at New American Theater of Peter Pan. I am Kevin Cronin, Doc Slavkowski substitute and also producer of The Art Zone. We're here with Paul Hartman, who is the technical director of the production. And Paul, tell me uh, some of the things that are going on around here. Well, we're, uh, we're putting up the screens in Neverland oh. right now, um, getting ready for a flying rehearsal coming up shortly. Um, there are three major sets for this production, uh, the first being the nursery. Uh, which is two large units that uh, start the show. Um, during the scene shift, those units split in the center and go away, and we go into Neverland, and uh, the painted drops are revealed, along with the screens that you see behind me that they're working on. Um, after that, there's a large tree that rolls out, and that uh, and it has a slide incorporated in it. It's a pretty cool-looking thing. Did you build these, or did are you? There's a set designer, and how do you interact? Can you go into some, some of that? Um, there's a, a set designer, and uh, he sends us plans, and from those plans we build all the scenery. And my jo my job specifically is to order materials, make sure things get built, make sure everything gets done on time, and make sure everything works. So I'm kind of busy. Um, with that, also I, I do do some building. Uh, the tree unit was kind of my project for this show. Um, put that together. It's a styrofoam tree that we carved and then covered with material. So you have a, if that's the only thing you did, you must have a crew. Then. Right. We have uh, several people working here. There's a master carpenter and another carpenter. Uh, we also have a master electrician who um, does some carpentry work for us. We brought in some outside artists to help us. Uh, Joan Lee Stasi and Mark Adamati came in and spent about a week here helping us paint some drops right here on the stage floor. Paul, you have a lot of uh, a lot of things moving around in here. We have a ship being moved right now. You also have, of course, Peter Pan flying overhead. There must be some constraints you must have had to work around with. Uh, I believe they're called the flying foys or mm -hmm. something like that. Tell me some of the things you had to deal with. Well, the uh, the designer had to spend a lot of time talking with uh, the foys on the phone and trying to figure out what he needed to do to have the uh, the flying work. Um, so some of his design was set in stone by where we needed to place the track and you know how big of a, a window opening we needed. Um, there are also is um, uh, we need uh, bits of scenery that. Peter Pan can land on out on stage. Like for the nursery scene, it's a bed. Um, during the pirate scene, um, they land on a, a crate unit. My name is Eric Rouse. I work with Foy Invent Enterprises, which is also known as Flying by Foy, um, which flies Peter Pan, among many different other things that happen throughout the country, Wizard of Oz, stuff like that. And we work out of Las Vegas, Nevada. We're here to do the production of Peter Pan for the New American Theater. And uh, I am the flying director for this show. Um, that's what they call us. Go around and choreograph the stuff, choreograph the flights, kind of work in sync with the choreographers, the directors sometimes. A lot of times they give us our own free reign to do what we like but I like to work with the people to get kind of a feel of what they've been doing up to that point because you know we're kind of coming in at the end of the process. For Peter Pan's system there's two operators. It basically works on the same concept that's been I mean for hundreds and thousands of years it's based on just simple mechanical advantage that the Greeks did way back when. Um, basically the operators are pulling half of Peter Pan's weight but they're also pulling twice as much so if Peter wants to go three feet off the floor the operator has to pull six feet of rope. That's where you get the mechanical advantage. And then there's another operator who does travel, both left and right. And that's actually the trickiest part, because what happens is, depending on your height of the theater, here we have a very low space, depending on the height, Peter can get swinging. And that's where the operator has to figure out where to cancel out the swing so that they can be still and stuff like that. And of course, it's, it's difficult for them seeing in, in a straight-on plane what the audience is seeing in kind of a picture plane. So it's a little tricky. 
that aspect of it. As far as um, when we come into a space, we have certain uh, parameters that we do ask the designers to adhere to. Um, we obviously have to have the windows opening so that Peter can come in, and we like to make it look magical, so the op there are operators that take care of that. The lighting designer, we like to make sure that there's a lane basically where our track will go. And um, usually we have a theater where you have line sets, so we have a line set that's dedicated to the track. In this case, it was a little trickier, so I had to deal with um, Brenda a lot, the lighting designer, and she was very easy to work with, and, and I was really happy about that. Um, so, yeah, we have to have that lane so that the track can go, and if Peter swings a little bit that she or he won't smack some lights around and stuff like that. Um, that's really about it. Um, it. It really all depends on the space. Every space is different, so you can't really say if there's a, a steadfast set of rules for it. Um, as far as the company goes, it's been around, I think it's around 40 years now, maybe a little over 40 years. I think December 12th is a, a 40th anniversary of the company, something like that. But they started out, basically Peter Foy is from England. He came to the States and did uh, Mary Martin's Peter Pan on Broadway. And that's where that got started up. And the company just basically grew from that. So we'll do about 10 to 15 Peter Pans a month. And we also do industrials and uh, fashion shows. We do a lot of uh, angels in churches and stuff like that. So it's, it's really diverse what we do within. I mean, it is just flying, but we do a lot of different things with it. And a lot of the equipment that we use have been patented for years. The harnesses are on patent. The track is on patent. It's our own special track. So it's, we're very much a self-sufficient business and there's only one other company that's starting to do it. Um, but basically we're it as far as this goes. I think the funnest part of it, that's one of the reasons I did theater. You know, every place is different. Every show is different. Yeah, you're doing Peter Pan, but, but Every set is completely different. The people you're working with are different, and it's good to know that you've kind of left your mark somewhere and that they can take care of it, and if there's a problem, they can take care of it. It's Yeah, it's a good feeling to know that. And now Dennis Horton pays a visit to the kitchen at Octane Inner Lounge to see what head chef Eric Olson is cooking up at this cutting-edge downtown eatery. I'm Dennis Horton. So you're going to an Inner Lounge for dinner, specifically Octane Inner Lounge. If you're like me, the question is, what is that? With me is Eric Olson, who is the head chef here at Octane, and he can tell us. Thank Eric, you, Dennis. What is an Oct Inner Lounge, and specifically Octane? Octane would fall under the guise of a, a cyber cafe. Um, in the metropolitan areas, you'd find um, similar restaurant bars to Octane here in Rockford. And what we feature here are uh, tapas-style cuisine, um, excellent coffee drinks, extensive beer and wine, list and uh, just great entertainment plus the computers for sure of course tapas um, if you pick up the menu and i've looked at it it's really sort of a fascinating thing but i would be at wit's end as to what is tapas can you tell me what that is all about tapas is a traditional spanish style of dining where as opposed to having just one large entree you uh you graze on several other smaller dishes so your whole experience is uh one of variety and uh, good dining, basically. We're going to talk a little bit more about the restaurant itself, but as a head chef here, what are some of the special things that you do? We do um, quite a bit with seafood, some Mediterranean-style pasta dishes, um, specialty bread items. Um, we utilize beef and poultry. Um, quite, a, quite a wide range of uh, uh, dishes, actually, Dennis. And lucky for us, you're going to show us something today. Absolutely. And what is it? I'm going to prepare um, the uh, grilled calamari vinaigrette, which is a tr traditional Spanish dish, which is sautéed in olive oil, wine, and herbs, and then taken from a range and then grilled and served with a salpicón sauce, which is a vegetable um, sauce almost similar to a relish, which is served with a lot of dishes in Spain. Mm, sounds great. Let's get to it. All righty. First off, you want to have yourself a a preheated pan that's got just a little bit of olive oil in it. And what I'm going to do next is add some fresh basil, some capers. Get those in there. Put some herbs. Dried herbs are okay. I've got some fresh shallots here. Let that kind of simmer a tad. Add a little bit of white wine. Chardonnay is great. And what I'm using is a large um, squid steak, is what they call it. There's no tentacles here. This is just basically the body of the squid. 
and I'm going to simmer that at high heat for probably about two or three minutes. Let that go, and then from that point, I'm going to place it on the grill just to finish it off. You know, it doesn't look like calamari with tentacles and things um, that you normally look at, and sure, it's, I know that appetizing. It's um, it's actually a, a staked calamari. It's from a larger squid, and when you do, when you cook it in this process, high heat with a little bit of olive oil and wine, it uh, it keeps it tender, and it, you don't you you don't have that typical squid that most people are associated with um, being tough, and it's definitely not breaded. This is a lot more healthy for you, and it, traditionally the way that it is um, eaten in Spain. Now that we have this squid simmering and it's nicely seared on both sides, we're going to transfer it to the grill. Beautiful. Pasta time. So what I've done here is I've arranged a little mescaline, some lettuce, some, some basil. And I'm basically going to just place the calamari on the plate. And finish it with the salpicone sauce. And there you have it. Calamaris a la Verangreta. From Octane Inner Lounge, I'm Dennis Horton for the Art Zone. Eric, thanks a whole lot for your work. Thank you, Dennis. Enjoy. I will. Why not? That's mm. really, really good. And now, Art to Art with Rockford artist Betsy Youngquist. Interviewed by artist Scott Snyder, sitting in for Matt Herbig. Hi, I'm Scott Snyder, and I'm here at J.R. Cortman, and tonight I am with Betsy Youngquist, who is currently showing her work at Cafe Esperanto. Uh, Betsy, let's first start off with your beginnings and how you became interested in art. Okay, um, I have been involved in creating art ever since I was very young. I um, always have been messing around with it. When I actually in high school, I went to Auburn and I was in uh, the academy, and then I was in what is Kappa now, which was a visual arts uh, accelerated program. So I, art was a focus. But when I went to college, I um, went in as a biology major because I really wanted to be a marine biologist. Of course, you don't go to school in Chicago to be a marine biologist. It's not a real good idea. <laughs> they basically had a pre-med track, and that was it. You can wait in Lake Michigan <laughs> exactly. a little bit. So uh, through, through four years of college, I drifted in more and more into the arts and ended up graduating with a, a bachelor's degree and with an art major. And from there, I ended up going to school in uh, Madison. I got my master's degree in art education. And uh, always was working on art on the side. Um, always in a closet sense, though. I, you know, I was always a waitress first, or I was um, you know, an, an, a substitute art teacher first. I never really considered myself an artist, but it was important to me, and I was always doing it on the side. And then I started showing here in Rockford about seven years ago, probably. And um, since then, I, 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 it's just kind of grown. I, I show fairly regularly. I've um, shown in Chicago, in Wisconsin, um, and all over Rockford. So, so um, you called the show ARC. Mm -hmm. uh, give us an explanation. Um, the idea behind ARC um, came to me a few months ago, and, and it just popped in my head, and I thought, this is right, I'm going to go with it. And it was basically the idea that the subject matter that I'm going to be showing really is centered around animals. And the idea of the ark being the, a vessel that keeps what is within it safe was interesting to me. Also the idea that if you take Noah's ark, 
The idea that man was in the ark with the animals, wasn't steering the ark necessarily, but was there as the caretaker of the animals. And, and I like that idea. And it even transcends into what's going on right now in our natural world and that man needs to be the caretaker of these animals and of life, that it, there's a connected continuum to all of it. And that's very interesting to me. Um, the idea, for example, that if, if I get a cut on my toe, my toe might seem to be very far away from the rest of my body and I might really not need to take care of that toe. But if I don't take care of it, I might get gangrene and that will kill my entire body. And I think that same concept can be transferred to our natural world. That we can't be careless with things just because they're not immediate to us because it's going to come back and bite us if we don't take care of it. So that's kind of the idea of arc and caretaking and animals and humans and everything kind of coexisting and also being interconnected. In your new work, I, I, I do see more emphasis of the animals. I mean, there are some right. human figures that enter right. in there. Um, the piece with the rabbit head, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that, that's an interesting piece if you want to talk about that. Okay. Um, I have, there, there's a term called theory anthrope, which I bumped into in a book, and it's a term that means mythological creatures or spiritual beings that are part animal and part man. And I really like that term, theory anthrope. I have a tendency to do that a lot, to put an animal with a person. And when I do this, to me what this is, it's a human with a mask of a rabbit on top of the human head. And what I, what I do when I, when I incorporate these animal elements is I try to go in blind. I try to just say, okay, here is a, here's a, a figure. What animal do I feel like putting on, on it as a mask? Then, now with a rabbit, I already know because I've used this motif a lot. But what I like to do then is go back and check in a Native American dictionary of symbolism, animal symbolism, and say, okay, how come I had a need to put a rabbit on? What does a rabbit symbolize? What can this tell me about things maybe in my life right now I need to be looking into or learning about? The rabbit is, now when you get into symbolism, of course, different cultures have a lot of different symbols for the same animal. But the rabbit um, is often the symbol of fear. And I find that I use rabbits a lot. And so to me, it's some kind of a lesson of something that I, I need to, to work on or look into. It's, it's, a, it's a beacon that's telling me something. So I think it's really neat. Mm -hmm. Have you gone through all of your animals and found what they represent and different? Right. Um, some I know, some I don't. For example, this, or I know and I don't retain it. You mm -hmm. know, I might look it up when I'm done, but I don't necessarily retain it. This is, to me, was a coyote head and I've really never done a coyote head before. It, it could be a wolf, could be a dog, who knows. But to me, this was a coyote. And the coyote is a trickster. And I didn't, and I called this a land of enchantment, and I kind of did that tongue in cheek, and I don't really, I haven't really figured this one out yet. But for some reason, we see a UFO, we see a trickster, and we see crosses, and it's called the land of enchantment. So if anybody can figure it out for me and drop me a line, let me know what it means. I'd appreciate it. I see UFOs occasionally in yeah. the work they go yeah. in and out. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. These are interesting pieces here, um, the pieces that are beadwork um, that have animal, you know, dog, right. cat, fish, raven. Uh, tell me a little bit about these and how these fit into the theme of the show. Well, um, this, this was just something that, again, I was sitting down at on my studio and I was thinking I, I want to bead something, what I want to bead, what would be a quick thing, and I must have not done the dishes or taking the dishes out of my studio and I saw some, some silverware and I thought, well, I better go downstairs and hit up, uh, take this, the silverware out of my mom's cupboard that she won't really miss. So I did, I went through all this silverware. Oh, this is an odd piece, I'll take this, she won't notice. And so I just beaded a handle and when I got done with the handle, I thought I'm gonna continue to bead the bottom part. And I thought, what can I put on this? And just the thought of animals. Um, came to me. I like the fact that when people look at something like this and they were responding to it, the reason why they're responding to it, are they responding to it because they like the colors? Are, there, are they responding to it because they like cats? 
is probably a a uh, combination of a, of a lot of different elements, but I like that fact that that there are different keys in this that are causing someone to respond in different ways. Um, I also kind of like the idea that let's say someone picks a rhino and they take rhino home and they hang rhino on the wall. There's kind of an idea that now they're maybe they're going to pay a little bit more attention to to rhino for whatever reasons. I, that's that's not really w real well thought out, but there's some kind of a, a connection thing that I'm. Why are we attracted to things and and that's kind of some strange, vague way that's that. Well, Betsy, I'd like to thank you for uh, letting me interview you, first of all. And uh, you it's been a pleasure. Very interesting things to say about your work. I, very insightful. I've always been an admirer of your work. Um, I look forward to seeing the show. Oh, so let's go upstairs and take a look. And... Uh, Again. Grab your fork so we can have yeah. some cheesecake. And maybe I'll stir some uh, cappuccino there with you go. rhino spoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not dishwasher safe. Well, oh, okay. Cappuccino safe, but... Yeah. Do not try this at home. No. Art Zone takes you to the Rockford Art Museum for some sights and sounds of the opening night of the Tom Heflin Retrospective Exhibition. We're at the opening night of the Keith Grace Art by the Yard at the Cortman Gallery. And uh, this has been quite an evening here. Lots of people and lots of excitement. And it's something that's maybe not been done before. Tell us about how you came up with the idea and a little bit about the show itself. Okay, sure. Um, actually, I came up with the idea about five years ago and we were sitting in this very cafe and uh, we were doing, a, we were just here for an art opening and there was an artist that had a lot of uh, canvases and they were a lot of the same content and a lot of the same detail and we just noticed that as the canvas size went up the price of the artwork went up and and I thought well it's kind of like charging by the yard and I kind of said it half jokingly and I'm not ridiculing the artist because one of the toughest things to do is to price your own artwork and but I kind of kept thinking about that concept art by the yard and and uh, so for about the past, past five years uh, you know, every year I'd say, well, you know, I should do that art by the art thing. I finally decided this year that I would do it. And um, what I did, the process was really pretty interesting because um, I got the roll of vellum that I did the whole painting on. And uh, because my table is only eight feet long, I only did about a stretch of eight feet at a time. And I never really planned out what the whole piece was going to be. In fact, I never knew what the next eight feet were going to be until I rolled, uh, you know, the one I'd finished and rolled out the new one and just started... Uh, you know, just doing whatever I wanted. I revisited a lot of the same images I had painted before, but um, as you can see, the color's a lot more brilliant. Um, there's a lot more collage and a lot more texture in, in a lot of the work that I did. And um, so uh, really the whole process was doing it a little bit at a time. And then once I was done with the whole 14 yards, I went back and reversed through it and did some detail work. And the first time I actually got to see the whole thing all together was when we hung it two days before tonight. So it was kind of exciting. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations on a successful opening and a great concept. Thanks a lot, Doc. Well, thanks for watching The Art Zone. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Stop in and see us at J.R. Cortman Center for Design downtown at 107 North Main, or give us a call at 968-0123. And as we close, we're going to take you back to the Rockford Art Museum for the opening night of the Tom Heflin exhibition. This is The Art Zone. This is the art zone.
Nancy Froelich speaking for the Art Zone. Past Art Zones can be checked out at the downtown Rockford Public Library. Art Zone is funded by J.R. Cortman Center for Design and Cafe Esperanto, downtown Rockford. This is the Art Zone. 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 This is the Art Zone.